today we're going to talk about knowledge graph extraction from unstructured data and uh, semantic role labeling by Vivek Katan. He's an AI researcher of uh, Central Labs. And the first, we'd like to still introduce ourselves as a SF Bay ACM. Uh, we founded in 1957, promoting knowledge of modern computing, creating a community support networking, and hiring. We only charge a $20 annual membership fee. Just click on the join on sfbayacm.org website. We have a two monthly meetings. The first one is the general computing, typically on third Wednesday of the month. And the data science special interest group, typically on fourth Monday of the month. We also have a joint meeting schedule with the AI camp and the valleyml.ai. Now, the upcoming webinars on Tuesday, tomorrow, July 28th, 2020, from 9 a.m. to 15.30 PST. It's a responsible data in the time of a pandemic by 19 speakers, including UCB and MIT's professors and two award winners. Detailed is on Meetup and click on the, uh, click on the link on the comment section. Monday, August the 3rd, 2020, from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. is a workshop put up by AI Camp. It's a real-world reinforcement learning by Microsoft Teams of six and led by Chen Tan and Rajin Cherry. On Wednesday, August 19, 2020, we have productive impl uh, implications and testing challenges on moving to microservices by Jeff Ellison, and he's a consultant. On Monday, August 24, 2020, a case study on data quality with the COVID-19 pandemic by Michael Scoffit, and he is MBA and assistant clinical professor of Loma Linda University. And please use Q&A in Zoom for question to the speaker. Use chat on Zoom or YouTube for questions to the panelists. An announcement for job, jobs and other events post on the Meetup comment section. Let's uh, review what uh, Vivek have done. And uh, he was, he's currently focused on the semantic role labeling entity and the relationship extraction, close and open domain knowledge graph creation and uh, is working on common sense reasoning. He has published in the ECIR and the Information Retrieval Journal. Uh, he's organizing a workshop for knowledge graph for social goods and collaborating with the United Nations. And it will be a part of the knowledge graph conference happening at the Columbia University. And the prior, he has worked as a chat system researcher at the Spark Cognition. And he has experience in the applications of diverse machine learning methods, including information retrieval, survival analysis, and anomaly detection. Vivek has a master's degree from the University of Texas at Austin with a specialty in data mining and the machine learning. And he has a bachelor's degree from the India Institute of Technology Darha uh, about India. And he also have a hobby of reading novels, hiking, and explore San Francisco coffee shops. Let's welcome Vivek, see what he will talk about today and in his coffee shop. Hey, uh, hello, um, uh, about myself. I I'm Vivek Ketan. Uh, I'm an AI researcher at Accenture Labs San Francisco. I mostly work on various NLP techniques, information retrieval, um, have been working on automatic knowledge graph extraction from unstructured text uh, for the last um, two years and uh, currently focusing on common sense reasoning and causality in text. Today, today, I will talk about how to extract knowledge graphs automatically from unstructured text. Knowledge graph has been an area of interest in AI for more than a decade, or I would say millennia. Like people have been 
working on semantic wave forever. Uh, what happened recently with the new or more sophisticated NLP and information retrieval methods, we are able to automatically extract the knowledge and represent them. Uh, I will talk about uh, knowledge graph extraction uh, and how it will be helpful in one use case, uh, staying compliant. So we all uh, need to stay compliant, be it an organization, public or non-public utility, or uh, any education, set, like whatever business we do, we are supposed to follow rules. But the biggest challenge there are, there's, there are so many of them and they are changing. Uh, someone read these documents line by line, understand them, someone who knows about the domain and still banks are paying, actually paying $270 billion expending that much money just to stay compliant and still end, uh, ending up paying $100 billion or more fees uh, uh, because of non-compliance. So the idea is what's missing there and how knowledge graph can help and why uh, we think a knowledge graph can be a good solution um, in this problem. So let's uh, read through one of the article from Fed, uh, financial regulators. It's an actual press release from financial regulators. And it's just one paragraph of one press release. We have this kind of press release all the time. And we have various regulatory authority, be it OCC, Federal Register, uh, FDIC. Uh, so when we read this, how as human we read, uh, we skim through this and like uh, a person will say, okay, uh, there is office of controller of currency, even if uh, the person is not from this field, will be able to understand uh, maybe some authority or uh, similarly changes, changing something and delay. So that's how we read. We go through any document, scheme through it, uh, trying, uh, we try to understand some of the important keywords based on the semantics around it. And based on our background and understanding of how language works, we are able to extract some part of it connect in our mind and think, okay, it sounds like a delay applies to a bank or business or infer something. If you are a bank, you see this way. A single paragraph from one single federal registry document needs this much work. Think of it, how much background information we need here. We need to know there are authorities that can ask you, uh, propose some rules and it can affect you. So, but we, we just don't have one authority. We have various authority, new news releases are coming. What if a regulation is proposed today? You are a small bank. You're following a tons of regulation that you're supposed to follow as a small bank. A new regulation comes in, is approved today, and now you're a large bank. You have to change the way you do business in your country, the way you do business with your clients and the way you do business in various other countries. So uh, the idea is if Knowledge Graph can help us, so why, uh, I'll start from there, because it's not just about, uh, like when we are dealing with this kind of problems, we are just not trying to decide the polarity of the information if uh, the sentiment is positive or negative. The given uh, text belongs to class A or class B. We need to do that. I'm not saying that's not important, but when you're trying to understand the information you have, you need to semantically represent them somehow. And many times uh, when the problem is uh, this big, uh, you want to look back, okay, why I made this decision, why to make some decision. So uh, knowledge graph can uh, help us by semantically representing individual silos of data and that combat information overload somehow. And it's also a very intuitive structure. You can see what's happening, what its nodes are, what uh, relationship they hold. So uh, knowledge graph can be seen as knowledge in the form of graph, they are heterogeneous graphs. So two nodes can have more than one type of relationship, can be directed or undirected. So, uh, and it, it helps, uh, it, it's the most important tool in any knowledge driven task. You, you don't want to do just like deep models are doing great. We, uh, I will be talking about some of the deep models, but how to use those deep model to uh, do some tasks in knowledge driven way so that you can look back and see why we are doing whatever we, we are doing and decisions you are making. So where knowledge graph comes from? Uh, so there are three ways, uh, like knowledge graph comes from structured data. So our databases are like a ton of data. Uh, if we represent them in a graph format that can be said as a knowledge graph, but those are structured data. They're readily available. And it, you can see that as a current form of the world. So you manually curate them or someone type it in. Uh, so you know how the world is 
it can be some tables, wiki data. So whatever structured data you have can be a knowledge graph. And then it also comes from the unstructured data, uh, like web, a lot of postings on social media, news, press releases. So those unstructured data can be a complementary or what's changing about the world. So you have a view of the world, of a view of the problem, and then something changed. Uh, you have a view of a disease and some new aspect of the disease uh, was uh, identified by researchers, they published a paper. So th uh, then you need to extract the important part or relevant part about the disease, what you want to look into, your use case from that unstructured data, extract it and relate it or link it to the structured data. And then you can make uh, some decisions on top of it, various type of prediction tasks, uh, where, like, a lot of knowledge driven uh, stuff has been done. Uh, question answering or uh, ranking uh, information retrieval. Uh, there are knowledge graph for images and videos as well. So today's talk, I will talk about how to extract knowledge graph from unstructured data and why, and some of the techniques uh, that may be helpful. So in the end, what we want, we want a, an automated system that can classify our important information, the information that is important to us, extract the relevant concepts, relationship between those con concepts, how those concepts are related, connect them together, and then notify the user for any impact the user is going through, like anything that changes or anything impacting. I'm talking about the banking domain. Uh, so in that, like a large bank getting impacted by a pandemic or large bank getting impacted by a change in rule, how uh, their settlement cycle of housing loan has changed overnight. So uh, the, uh, we come back to the question, how to create a knowledge graph? So um, it's very simple. Uh, you have a ton of unstructured data. You extract some knowledge represented as graph and then visualize it and do graph analytics on top of it. You can do knowledge graph inference like link prediction and probabilistic graphical models on top of it to reduce the noise. Um, one important thing to know, the more automated system we have, we'll get higher recall, but lesser precision. So someone manually reading every document every paragraph, every sentence will be able to represent it logically in the best possible way. But how many people? It's like you're trying to vacuum a beach. You cannot do it. So we need automated system. So for those automated systems, there is going to be loss of precision, but at the benefit of uh, increasing recall. So that's what we are targeting. So I'll talk about how we are doing that automated system, how a few methods, a person uh, working on automated extraction of knowledge graph can reduce uh, noise and then uh, uh, a possible use case around this. So let's talk about OCC press release. So again, Office of Controller of Currency is uh, ba controls banks, most of the banks in US. So it is an actual article from one of the press release uh, from Office of Controller of Currency. I just copied it and I'm uh, showing it here. It's public, anyone can uh, go to their website and uh, access this data set. So what we want, like when we want to extract knowledge graph, we want to identify important, important concept in any news article like this and how that will happen. Someone will go with the domain knowledge and kind of start highlighting the thing or writing it uh, aside. Okay, these are the authorities uh, and they control national banks, federal saving association and FDICs to provide institution. And uh, there is a three day settlement cycle for housing loan settlement. Now it's T plus two days. And the person knows, okay, three days is T, now it's five days settlement cycle is there and end up building a domain knowledge graph. Uh, so that's how we manually build the domain knowledge graph or you can see it as a view of the world. So you have a view of the world based on whatever happened till today. And then a new news article came in. So you have a use case. You, you cannot look for every possible things changing in the world and every possible way they're impacting you. So you choose like four or five things. Uh, okay, if there is a change in threshold in any settlement cycle, if there is change in uh, geopolitical si uh, situation that impacts my business in some other countries, those are the things you decide to represent. So uh, we have a worldview. Uh, look at this graph. So uh, assume it as already built manually built worldview current knowledge graph and you have acquired this knowledge uh, with, uh, and with common domain, domain understanding you have built this so we know these three institutions uh, the bubbles in green uh, operates for security purchases and we know national banks does lending business and OCC FDIC administered them 
and they are proposing and announcing new regulations. So this is the of the, uh, how the world is today. And then the news article you just saw in the previous slide came out. You want to know how that will impact uh, your business, your day-to-day -day business. So either you can extract everything from that, or you can define a certain small schema. And then you automatically try to extract uh, these values. So the in each of the box, the text in black is the uh, schema or slot. Uh, you can say the slot name. And the, uh, the value of that slot in the previous news article is uh, in the text in the blue, uh, sorry, red. We want an automated way to extract this information and link it to our existing knowledge graph so that you can see how it's impacting your day-to-day -day business. So again, this is the same knowledge graph, uh, the, uh, the one we saw two slides back. The dotted lines are the new information you just got from the change in uh, settlement cycle. Now we know settlement cycle is T plus two days. This bulletin uh, 201722 came in, FDIC proposed this, and it affects national bank. So if you're a national bank operating security purchase, you know settlement cycle has changed its, its, its proposal. So you need to be ready for it, how it impacts you or how it impacts your day-to-day -day business. That's where knowledge graph helps. So it's knowledge driven. You can understand what's happening. It's automatic. So there are a lot of ways where uh, this kind of uh, this kind of inference has been done using totally ontological driven or taxonomy driven approaches. So uh, I'm proposing a way how to combine them together. So you have a small schema. You're automatically extracting the values of a small schema and using that to quantify the impact of any change on you. So what we need for these things, we need three different, um, I would say uh, knowledge, your domain knowledge, back, background understanding, based on domain knowledge, how the world works and your priorities. So then we connect the relevant part of any new incoming information based on these three high level ideas. Okay, so let's come back to our previous slide. So we need to build knowledge graph for whatever we wanna do. We have a world knowledge you, you created manually, but you cannot do that manually all the time. So uh, knowledge graphs are created using two simple ways uh, as I uh, told earlier, knowledge extraction and graph construction. Knowledge extraction uh, involves few methods and graph extraction and construction as well. And there are various other ways. And uh, uh, then there is noise reduction methods and it's very active area of research because it's very difficult to quantify the, uh, the noise or reduce, have the minimum noise when you're doing automated ways. Many times it's unsupervised and supervised. What it does when you create a knowledge graph, so all these methods in the uh, mentioned the knowledge extraction as well as graph construction, they identify who are the entities, those slots, you, you decide your custom slot, or you can have previous, previously open source, well-trained models for entities like name, person, place, organization, and various other. What are the attributes? If you can capture some attributes about those entities, uh, if you have defined that in your schema and how they are related, how they're interacting with each other. So that's, this all method do just these three things and that's what a knowledge graph is. So let's walk through uh, some of the uh, methods and what it actually does. So uh, I'm picking the sentence from the article we just saw. So uh, we are doing uh, knowledge extraction using open information extraction. So open information extraction is an unsupervised task of generating a structured machine readable representation of the information in text, usually in form of triples. So there will be subject, there will be verb, there will be object. So it does this automatically given every sentence. So uh, there are, I would say all, seven or eight type of uh, automatic information extraction modules. The, uh, so we, we are using Stanford OpenAI, it's public, you can use it for your use cases. So uh, what's the difference? The information you extract using anything, it's not facts, it's a potential fact. There may be noise, there may not be. So it is a potential fact. That's what we need to keep in mind. And we need to reduce the noise once you extract the information. So uh, running the same sentence, so it gives something like this, what it says. So for each relation, there is an entity subject and object. So one uh, knowledge you're extracting is OCC issued notice. Then another, another um, sorry. Hmm. Okay, so another uh, for sort and relation, 
you are extracting notice is shortening the settlement cycle and various such knowledge you extract many of them may be of your use many of them may not be of your use so that's when noise reduction comes into play so the extracted knowledge is ambiguous many time incomplete and can be inconsistent so these are the few uh, things we have to keep in mind when we are doing any automatic knowledge extraction modules and we need to do that because new information is coming in new data is coming in we cannot have people sitting manually doing this kind of job forever so how to reduce that noise so one way of reducing that noise is extracting the entity you are interested in manually or, or, or automatically so named entity recognition can be helpful there so uh, named entity recognition can be identify when you say this uh, string of text as things some string of text or thing maybe person place organization location time and various other but if you look into this sentence occ and national banks both are strings and we can say they are organization and we can if we use a standard name entity extraction it will mark them as organization so should we extract both of them so it depends so you want to use open ie and filter them based on this domain heuristic you decide you can decide it uh, uh, like if you have label data you can define your own named entities and train a model or you can go directly with the open source available sources and put some domain ontology based restriction and heuristics to further fine tune it so we uh, we actually got some data labeled and defined these named entity extractors so if you see these named entities so occ is a regulator so are the same named entity that were present in our previous schema the schema we decided what we want to extract from um, unstructured text coming in and the security purchase is a regulated activity and national banks are regulated entities and threshold values is 3 days so an, a train named entity recognition system will give you output for whatever slot values are there so it takes uh, the deep model based named entity recognition system will take a sequence of text for each of these texts it will give you the probability of it being uh, what class of entity that's how it decides uh, what entity class it is once we have this entity we want to see how a pair of entity interact a basic way of doing that is simple relation extraction so we know occ is there three days is there how they are interacting what potential relation they may have so uh, again for relationship extraction there are open source relationship extractors or you can train your own and uh, or there are some unsupervised way where you create a dependency tree of the given sentence and based on the nodes you select the main verb uh, putting some linguistic nuances based conditions so if you do that you can see a simple settlement cycle at relationship between these two nodes so uh, again there is uh, one important thing many time this relationships can be implicit those keyword may not be there in the sentence but that the relationship holds between these two entities so in that case uh, there are various approaches and models to quantify or extract those kind of relationship so let's go ahead uh, uh, with the simple uh, relationship that's explicitly mentioned in the text um, and what else so you have nodes you have relationship ex extracted so your graph is ready but is it ready no actually so um, so uh, there are various other methods uh, i will touch few more uh so named entity disambiguation so the same nodes can be mentioned in various ways so occ uh, you saw the previous article it was written as office of controller of currency and what if it become another node and then you are doing some inference and your because you are not manually reading everything your model is confused so we need to collapse those nodes and named entity disambiguation helps there so using named entity disambiguation system we can collapse these nodes together as sim single node you can decide that single node and there are various methods simplest one you, if you know okay occ of office of controller of currency you can create an entity dictionary or you can uh, there are other deep models and uh, very linguistic uh, feature based model as well so these three ways office of controller of currency occ office of controller of currency and occ occc is actually mentioned in the data given by occ now and then so they don't maintain a standard way of really uh, talking about themselves 
but we want that because our knowledge graph is going to be a graph about facts. So first you extract the noisy thing that's potential knowledge, then we denoise it using various techniques like that. And again, T plus three days, three days, three days. In the same article, they will talk about the concept of three days uh, in green settlement cycle in various ways. So we need to call it those graph as well. So here again, it will depend um, on your linguistic or I would say domain heuristics or uh, your end use. Uh, once we have this, in a way, we have a small knowledge graph. And um, if you remember my previous slide when I was talking about knowledge extraction and graph construction, you can use various those techniques. So uh, we need to do linking. So the OCC can be mentioned in different ways or say uh, auditor of OCC, uh, there's the person's name is there. So that uh, the person is auditor. So the same same person can be mentioned with different words, totally different words that you may not be aware of. So we need to do uh, link those things. We need to do co-reference resolutions uh, and uh, to further reduce the noise. Uh, after this, I'll talk about semantic role labeling. Uh, I will talk about semantic role labeling in very detail later on, but just a pictorial idea what it actually does. So semantic role labeling labels the role each of the entities or actors are playing in any given sentence or incident how it works. So each predicate is treated as an action that's happening and it tries to uh, predict who is doing what to whom and how, when, and various other similar roles that's possible. So in this sentence, we can easily see there are three predicates. Issued, something is being issued. We know that someone is issuing something. Sorten, okay, something is sorten and there must be some initial stage and some, uh, some uh, last stage there may be someone doing that and then purchased, something is being purchased. Can we automatically, can a single model automatically extract all these roles and map them together? So semantic rule labeling helps there. So this is the actual output from our model on this data set. So um, I will talk about the model we, which we use. Uh, uh, so it, it was able to extract this thing. So don't go crazy about A0, A1, I will describe in detail. So for A0 in general is the main proto agent, the person who's doing the main action in that incident, even on whom the action is being done, proto patient and proto agent. So again, in issued A0 is OCC is the proto agent doing an action of a notice to sort in. So OCC is issuing a notice. We can easily see that OCC is doing something about notice or issuing a notice. Then again, if you see the sort end, we know OCC sort in the settlement cycle. Now, and if you see the very last argument in the second row, it's AM time, TMP is about time. So how it's sorting by three days. So it's automatically understanding this part. If you have say three days extracted as a node, now we can see OCC is related by sorting the uh, settlement cycle by three days. So this kind of semantic understanding of language is necessary to map them as knowledge graph. And the last one, this is also, in, also interesting. If you see purchased, the sentence is security purchased by national banks. We can understand as human that national banks are purchasing security, but in the sentence, security is not the object, but it's still SRL, this SRL system was able to understand that national banks are a zero. They are the proto agent. They are doing some action of purchasing on security. That's why security is A1. So once you have this thing, so uh, it was more like, uh, I would say, I just walked you through four different uh, or five different algorithm you or anyone needs to extract a knowledge graph automatically. Then there will be a lot of denoising based on some automated methods of NLP as or uh, your domain understanding based on taxonomy of the domain or your task uh, boundaries. What will happen after this? The same article, someone does not need to do this manually. This can be labeled automatically. And uh, the same article, uh, we pushed it into uh, our system. We created a system called Cognitio uh, using various of these algorithms. And you can actually extract a knowledge graph like this. And further, you can do link prediction. I'll talk about link prediction a little bit. So link prediction is another denoising techniques and do some more inference. Uh, we have a drool-based engine. Um, uh, that's the domain heuristics I'm talking about. 
uh, because that was very task dependent. I'm not talking about what task we had and what exact heuristics we applied. So it's a little bit of iterative process. You apply those domain heuristics and set up an engine in top of this automatic extracted knowledge graph continuously automatic ex uh, extracting knowledge and alerting you whenever some change happens that impacts you. Okay, so that's mostly about knowledge graph. Now let's talk about semantic rule labeling. So what is semantic rule labeling and why we need to underst uh, understand it, read it. So semantic rule labeling is a way of meaning representation. And it's very old. The text you see on the left is from uh, Jurovsky and Manning book, Speech and Language Processing. And it's Sanskrit text. It's studied like decades, centuries back. Uh, so it's very old and its form has changed. So what is meaning representation? A simple sentence to explain meaning representation, it can be seen as a bridge between subtle linguistic nuances and common sense non-linguistic knowledge about the world. How any event is described in linguistics or any language and how we actually understand them in real world. Who is doing what to whom? So that's the difference. It's the bridge that makes that possible and uh, that understanding possible for machines or for us, even if we have a very complex uh, uh, sentence, it will go very, very out of control. So let's talk about meaning representation and then we'll move into uh, semantic role labeling. So meaning representation, it's a well studied and uh, researched uh, area in linguistics. So you are seeing here four different ways of meaning representation of a very simple sentence. I have a phone. All the sentences share the, uh, all the representation are sharing the same thought. So first is first order logic. So it's being used and uh, like uh, there, there's still a lot of fans uh, using this first order logics. Uh, and you define uh, who is having what and the person having is a speaker, had thing is a thing phone. And then you write these rules for everything. And at one time it stopped scaling up. They have great precision, but it stopped scaling up and new things come, keep coming. Then they are uh, with directed graph, you can do something same. The arc zero will be the person or having the, uh, the arc zero of the main verb. And then the uh, third one is textual form. It's just the same textual description of the directed graph. So the main predicate is have and uh, arc zero and arc one is there. So what, uh, who is having and what is having. And then frame based or slot filter representation is there. So this is also, uh, it is more recent than uh, other three methods and used a lot. So for each incident, uh, each predicate will become incident and you for having, they will be hover and had things. You decide for each predicate, you decide this kind of slots and search for this slot value. Who is the hover speaker? Who had the thing? Uh, what thing they had is phone. So you keep doing that. So uh, uh, meaning representation, all these forms share the same thought consisting of the structure, like very simple structure, like object, this property of object, and there's a relationship between them. But in language, similar events can be expressed in a variety of structure using a medley of sentence. So a common structure can be shared in various sentences expressing the same thought. If you look at the top, those four sentences are expressing the same thought, but they're very different. If we start writing rules like meaning representation the, or the rules I just uh, showed you in the previous slide, it may end up in totally different understanding. So we need a level of representation to capture the commonality between the sentences. What semantic commonality these sentences have if we want to build an automated system. That's where uh, semantic rule labeling comes into the picture. So it, what it does, it uh, represents the semantic understanding of the various actors in an incident and present, uh, and it overcome the, uh, I would say ambiguity or the beauty of the language, how in different ways we can represent the same thing. So similar structure expressed in variety of, sentences or using variety of keywords, how to get over it. So coming back to SRL and his, it, its history, it's as old as 8th century BC. So uh, it was studied by Panini. Um, the, he had a collection of eight books describing the linguistic structure of Sanskrit language. 
having 3,900 uh, rules, uh, more like the formal language theory we have, those rules I showed you in the very beginning. So uh, semantic role labeling, abstract meaning representation, there are other representation as well. Uh, so there is this deep role representation and then thematic role representation. So deep role um, and thematic role does not do as good as SRL. Why? Because deep role is very event specific. You write rules or uh, like those linguistic structure for different type of events. And again, you cannot scale up and the event can be expressed in various different ways. And then thematic rule, it captures the semantic common, Olympic, com like sem common semantic structure between various actor in the deep rule event. But the problem is the rules are either very abstract when they're at high level and when uh, thematic rules are written at lower level, it goes into too much specifics. That's where semantic rule labeling comes into picture. It's rule, uh, the extraction of semantic rule labeling is able to capture both very high level as well as low level struct semantic structure of the sentence. So let's look more into this. So what semantic rule labeling does. So it helps us understand the semantic relationship between a predicate and its argument. So the predicate becomes the main event happening and the argument are the actors in the event and how those actors are working. So it gives you the idea who did what to whom and perhaps also when and where, in what manner, if that information is in the given sentence. So uh, the assumption, the biggest assumption in SRL is, so the given linguistic structure or the sentence has some information that can be used to express the state of the world. So we are looking for something that is in the text, otherwise it won't give you, it won't, it won't be able to extract that's not there. So uh, let's, uh, see how it works. So semantic rule can be seen as a way to represent any linguistic structure in a structured representation that's high level as well as low level. So uh, let's uh, look into uh, the SRL outputs, those arguments we saw in the previous slides, what was A0, what is A1. I'll just walk you through them and some architect of uh, SRL. So this is a very standard uh, accepted SRL output in linguistic community. So A0 is always, so, okay. So semantic rule labeling breaks the actors based on the predicate. So we have prop bank, a big predicate, and uh, there are also uh, verb net and others. So I, I use prop bank based on a paper uh, I was implementing for my uh, recent work. So for a given event, you know the predicate. For, for that predicate, these are the arguments how different words in the sentence were related to that predicate. So A0 is proto agent, it's the main actor doing something. And ARG1 or A1 is the patient on whom the action of the uh, whatever is mentioned in the predicate is done by main agent. Then again, we have ARG2 and ARG3, they can have various different values, depending on what information you have in the sentence. Then ARG4 is endpoint, like uh, OCC decreased the settlement cycle from uh, five days to two days. So it will be always two days. And RM is modifier. And those M can have various values like time, PMP, location, direction, which manner, angry, or you uh, tom through uh, the bottle, very angry uh, from top of the building. So it, it will extract that automatically. So there are various ways of training a model to extract these arguments. So look at it this way. You have a given sentence, each sentence, each word can take any of this value. So we train a model for this. The first model is uh, like, this is the old, very used uh, uh, model where you take all the words, parse them for each predicate, you parse the word and get features and train a simple uh, supervised classifier. And then once you have that classifier given a new sentence, you give the output. So it was possible because of development of prop bank, word net, frame net, and various other similar, uh, like, uh, like uh, linguistic structure, I would say. It, it required a lot of work. Those are very standard and well-used linguistic resources. And a lot of new classification methods and optimization techniques are suggested. Uh, one of the most recent ones that did uh, great work was uh, this work by Tan et al. Uh, 
on that. So what they do, uh, it's again a deep model where they're taking a sequence of text and outputting the argument end to end. So they used a prop bank to uh, define the predicate or uh, what, what predicate to take and then trained a model like this. Uh, the good thing was the way they decided uh, that they designed it, it, it does not take the syntactic structure of the sentence. So it works fine in other domains as well. If the domain is semantically similar, even if the structure is syntactically different. Okay, that's about semantic role labeling. So this all methods can help you create the knowledge graph. Now you want to complete the knowledge graph. I'll just quickly walk you through a very simple algorithm of knowledge-based completion. So link prediction is that. So you have subject, you have relationship, and you have object. So link prediction is more like a word embedding or you say knowledge graph embedding, where it learn what subject object and relationship comes together. And once you give a new subject and object or two nodes, it tries to predict link how the two nodes are related based on how various other nodes are related in your knowledge graph. So there are various algorithm, distimult and convy uh, generally performs better. Uh, like others are also fine. Uh, uh, let's see the next thing. So yeah, so for link prediction, we also built a Python library, AmpliGraph. It's open source. You can get it on GitHub. It's uh, one of the projects we had at Accenture Labs. Uh, so given a node structure like that, you train the model on this triples, each triples, and then for a given new pair of nodes, it predict the possible link between them. So you complete the knowledge, you extract the knowledge graph, you complete the knowledge graph using SRL on link prediction, and then you write some heuristic rules on top of it for your domain knowledge. So a uh, final application for the, uh, the previous problem we just talked about can be like this. You, you query something based on, the, you extract the triples, the best triples you can extract, uh, and then you filter the knowledge graph based on your domain heuristic, your domain use, uh, and that will generate an alert. That will trigger an alert when that impact or the change is impacting you. At the same time, once that happens, you update your world knowledge with whatever new knowledge you acquired from the new incoming information. The same thing here, just another rep representation with the more, uh, the same text example we were seeing, this settlement cycle change happen, and if it's in, uh, like impacting you, uh, you get the alert or your knowledge graph mechanism or toolkit you develop will be able to alert and you know who to alert, like that you need to decide alert compliance team or everyone in the office or some important people and that alert will be sent automatically. Okay, that's it for today. Thank you. Yes, thank you. And I think there on the QA, there is a question. Okay, so uh, someone asked me, why don't you call A0 subject and A1 object? Or subject and A2 indirect object. So we are not we are saying what role it is playing. It may be subject or an object, but the idea is what role it is playing. That is that's going to be the attribute about that node. So we want to know this is the main actor. Like there, there can be main subject and other subject, but that subject is the main actor of the event you are working on. I don't understand your answer. Okay. He said, all right. Um, I'm replying on text. So I'm saying we want to understand the role. We are not saying it is subject. What that subject is doing, that is a semantic understanding of the text. It is subject. You can get that from dependency tree. But what is that doing? That is the whole idea. Like understanding the semantics of the role that subject or object is playing. Because you want to see who is changing what. You just don't want to know. Uh, it's subject. Okay. Now, okay. Now, is Stephen? Are you are you able to to say something? Yeah. Thanks, Diana. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think that uh, thanks. Thanks for your excellent talk. So yeah, I think I am. Uh, I wrote a comment in the Q and A, trying to paraphrase your point. So. Even if you say the three-day threshold rule was changed by OCC, um, syntactically, three-day threshold rule is the subject. But really, we want to say OCC equals A0, proposed changing, and then three-day threshold rule is presumably A1. Is that is that correct? Exactly. So if you have a big, very big knowledge graph, you, you, we are not working on one sentence. So we may have a lot of yeah. We want to know who is changing the threshold. No, no, sure. Mm -hmm. 
So, and, and uh, for your use case, you, uh, like as a small bank, assume you're operating a small bank, you want to control this part. Okay, if OCC and FDIC changes any role, uh, like yeah. domain, uh, understanding the I was talking about, then uh, alert me. If they change any rule about a uh, threshold cycle of set, uh, housing loan, uh, alert me. So that's where the threshold cycle is changing, but it is changed by OCC. OCC is the, OCC is the main actor. That's why we need to know that semantic information, who is doing it. To further gotcha. do those reasoning. Okay, so just uh, the, the, the main actor, the A0, is not necessarily the subject, although I imagine commonly they are. And you might like to give an example. When I saw the A0 to A5 terminology, and it, it doesn't correspond to anything I'd seen, you might like to give a motivating example of A0 is not necessarily the subject, and it's not necessarily the, fir the first thing in the sentence. If you see here, the security purchased by yes. national banks, but national banks are A0 here, but they are not necessarily subject here. Okay, can you, if you could label A0 to A4 in that sentence, is do we have an A2 in that sentence? No, no, no. It, uh, th this is the actual output from our model. So yes. this is not something I'm saying. If we don't have an A2 in that sentence, what's the meaning of defining A2? So uh, that is the thing I'm saying. If uh, semantic rule labeling extract the information available in the sentence. So for each predicate, it breaks the part of the uh, sentence that has some relevant role around that predicate. Oh, okay. So you're recursively parsing the same sentence to extract A0 predicate A1 relationships? Yes, exactly. So uh, I'm not doing recursively. That's how you uh, earlier uh, we used to do that. I'm doing okay, iteratively. Iteratively, so, left to right iteration. Yes. So yeah. So that's how people used to do that. If you see here, for each predicate, yeah. at each node. So each predicate, you are taking each each word that is each node. So that's how yes. why I had this slide. Uh, yeah. I'm, that was earlier method, but now we have moved to uh, end to end deep model and just yes. give, understand the probabilistic global probabilistic value and give you the output. Okay, sure. And it's, it's kind of an implementation. We could do it iteratively, it's, uh, recursively. It's kind of an implementation detail, whether we do it iteratively or recursively. And we're relying on the fact that we're dealing with a left to right language. Yes, okay. exactly. exactly. And so actually, uh, the features, you can control that part in the feature vector. For each predicate, for each node, uh, people used to define the feature vector. So those feature vector can be the, what, what is the main verb? Uh, what is the dependency tree? What is the, uh, the path of this uh, node to the main yes. verb? You can add those kind of features here. And uh, so uh, there are a lot of uh, suggested features. Uh, there's a paper by, uh, I think, Manning uh, 2000. Uh, they suggested uh, what kind of features to use. Uh, you can, I think, you uh, search for that Manning 2000 and uh, supervised uh, SRL feature suggestion. And there they suggested. So uh, they did a lot of experiment what kind of feature uh, improve the accuracy of extraction. Sure. And is, is, is SRL then, so it doesn't, it, so we're not requiring the language to be left to right. Is SRL largely independent of the language? Like I'm thinking of languages like German where um, the verb comes last. Oh, no, no, no. So it depends, like for each language, they will have their own uh, syntactic structure. Uh, yes. And because of that syntactic structure, you'll get, extract the features like dependency tree, main verb and all. So it will work for them. Mm -hmm, sure. In, in your work, have you only done English? I mostly do language. English? Yes. Have you done non-English language? I have done German a little bit uh, for some machine translation, uh, more of an experiment, but uh, uh, my work mostly as of now is around language. But thing is, if you can do one language, you have a parser, you can do another language as well. Some domain understanding helps, but that you acquire while you're working with the different languages. Mm -hmm. So like we have very good, uh, if you, uh, I mentioned that we have very good dependency parsers, um, uh, prop bank and those sort of things. No matter what language we, we are dealing with, you can easily get a deep uh, or language modeling based parser that will be helpful. Sure. Yeah, it, it might be interesting if you can show an example of a really, really hard example to parse, I guess that has lots of co-reference co and any yes. or and stuff like that. There is uh, some work there uh, from AI2 QASRL. So they ask question, uh, you can search for QASRL, uh, question okay. SRL by AI2. So they ask question around, so a factoid based question for each predicates to get a more deeper understanding of the sentence. So the, uh, based on my documents I was dealing, uh, this model by Tan et al uh, did a great job. So for further getting more deeper understanding, 
I think QA SRL is a very good model to try if you have some problem like that. Okay, thanks. And last last question and then I'll mute. Can you recommend, um, if I missed it, which packages do you use? Which packages are easy and simple to use in Python that do SRL? Uh, I haven't used any package actually. I kind uh -huh. of implemented a fine, like a trained the Tenet L model. So uh, I trained this model uh, by labeling some data because it says it's uh, somewhat domain dependent. So I haven't like I haven't used any package for SRL directly. There may be packages, but they are not deep learning based, and they fail. They don't fail. I would say they don't do a great job when complex sentences comes in because or uh, because again you are writing the rules and it gets slow. So I use this model and it did good job for my task. Understood. Yeah, I'm seeing I did a Google. I'm seeing references to Python. Uh, uh, sorry, NLTK, Allen NLP. So I mean, I guess all of the major open source and uh, proprietary. The APIs. model I suggested you, AI2, was from Allen NLP. AI2. That's uh, so they might have packaged it or some other model. So they're they're actively working yeah. on this. Sure, sure. I mean, again, as as a motivation, if you could show like here's a sentence that's like the limit of what you can do with shallow, and here's you know here's why we need deep instead of just asserting that we always need deep because shallow doesn't work. Yes, yes, so, so uh, that's what QASRL does. Like there may be shallow parsing and deep parsing, but uh, it depends on the use case again. How, how, like how, like it's again the uh, same, uh, how good you wanna be at each task. So uh, like we did those manual uh, labeling of entities and relationships. So our task was easier here. If you don't, if, if you do that automatically on pretend entities and you don't have, so uh, it was a finance domain. So FIBO is there, schema.org also has a small ontology. So you can write an easy uh, domain constraint to control some part of it. So it depends again, like how much work, work you wanna put there. I understand that may be helpful, but if doing the best SRL is the task, like is, is the goal, or that's actually stopping you from the end goal. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you ever hit any limits of like, limits of the, what's contained in your ontology or cases where your ontology is invalidated. Like if you start to read a 1920s article when there wasn't any SEC, okay. for example. So I haven't, uh, okay. So I don't work more with that semantic side. So my work is mostly on this automatic extraction. And uh, so there, so if you see the most of the ontologies, like uh, I was uh, uh, listening to Danny in one of the talk, uh, uh, I, it's more of a meta information. Those ontologies are meta information. So they are helpful, but not enough. So there are some work uh, of automated uh, ontology extracts and, and that like, you can also look into that direction if uh, that excites you. No, no, sure, sure. But I mean, my, my, my question is like, there's this implicit assumption everywhere that your ontology is fairly complete and always accurate and it never has mistakes. And we're never talking about something beyond its domain. But if we compare it, say the French financial regulator or whatever to the American one, and we just said it's done differently in France and gave a sentence why, now we're talking about something that's outside the domain of your ontology and your yeah. ontology may even be wrong. How do we handle that? So I can agree that your ontology is correct because it's manually created is the fact you want to represent best, but it's complete how you will define that. Like, can you like, can you completely represent a domain? <laughs> I, I don't think so. Like, uh, I don't think any ontology is complete. It may be complete for some task, but you say you have FIBO. FIBO is the biggest financial ontology. It's complete for everything uh, about finance. I, like, I don't think so, in my opinion. Ontologies are incomplete. They may be com they are correct. They're hundred percent correct because it's manually uh, defined. That's the uh, that's the heavy lifting there. It can be helpful to uh, like so. It's not okay. So uh, to answer your question, I don't think ontologies are always complete. They are always correct, uh, but you can use ontologies to uh, and then do some embedding based method to further extract the relevant concepts that were not uh, covered in the ontologies. Uh -huh. do, do you ever have to use uh, uh, topic identification? Like, so here, here you know that the, the article is about financial regulation, uh, but if it was about something else where OCC might be, you know, completely different. And if you miss resolved OCC, if you miss resolved the named entity, so do you have to do a first pass to say this article is about cricket, this article is about US financial regulation, this article is about international tax law? Do you have to do that? Yes, so uh, you have to do that. Like uh, you can find in that task somewhere, but you have to do that. Okay, okay. Yeah, me. thanks very much. There's a, there's a question from someone on YouTube. 
uh, Chair Deep, uh, can you use techniques like BERT to enhance this? Yes, actually, uh, the QASRL, they use language model. The model I was talking about for semantic rural extraction, they use language models. And most of the techniques in NLP are using language model as a layer. If you look into their paper, uh, they have used language models. And it, it, it's giving, uh, I think, uh, it, it's the best SRL model right now. I don't see any other questions. Without further ado, well, let's thank you for Vivek. Yep, thank you, Vivek. Well, thank you. Thanks for listening. Uh, can we get the a link to the to the slides at some point? Yes, I can um, give you more. So I'll remove some part, but I'll, I, I can uh, share some of it. Okay, we can post that uh, on our meetup page. Okay, great. Yeah, just submit a copy of that to us and we'll do that. I'll do that. Then, okay. Well, okay. thank you. Thanks for organizing it, Glenn, and Bill and everyone else. Okay. Bye bye. Okay. Hey, bye. Bye. Okay, we're closing. Okay, thank you all.